Continuing now in James chapter 1, last time we were in James, we had begun chapter 1, and we looked at the first five verses, and verse 5 read, If any of you lack of wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth not, and that word upbraideth uh, just simply means that uh, God does not, uh, he, he does not uh, put you down. Uh, he does not scold you. Uh, he does not uh, give any kind of reproach towards you. If you ask him for wisdom, uh, he, he's going to be accepting of that. And actually, he's desirous for you to do that. If you have a need, he, he wants you, in fact, to do that. And it shall be given him. So let's move today to verse 6 and look at the continuation of that passage, and we're, in fact, moving now into what we call our second mirror. Remember, there are seven mirrors in this first chapter, things that make us look at ourselves as we uh, read through this epistle. But let him ask in faith nothing wavering, and that is not to have your thought straying. Do not doubt. When you ask, ask in full confidence, knowing that when the Lord makes a promise, that he will indeed fulfill his promise. For he that wavereth, or he that doubts, is like a wave of the sea driven with the wind and tossed. And as we know, waves not only travel from place to place, but they change size, they change shape, they vacillate, they go up and down, they wander. Uh, they do all sorts of things, and, and this is the picture of someone who prays with doubt. We need to pray in, in full faith, trusting the Lord. Uh, we find, uh, even in the case of the Lord Jesus, he speaks about returning to his own hometown and his own home city, and he said you know, he could not do many mighty works there for the lack of faith that existed. He, he healed a few sick folk there and so forth, but really he is not going to force himself upon you in any way. And if you don't trust him to do something, if you don't believe in him that he is going to do what he's promised, uh, he's not going to force that promise upon you. But even a little bit of faith, as he said, the faith like a mustard seed, just the smallest of all seeds that produce a tree. Uh, and that's the true definition, the true translation of that passage, the smallest seed that will actually produce a tree with branches that a bird can lodge in, make nests in. Uh, that is all of the faith you need for God to work. Verse 8 is very telling. It's one of the ver first verses that I memorized uh, when studying this chapter. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. This term double-minded uh, comes from the Greek word dipsuchos, and it literally means vacillating, uh, to, to sway back and forth, kind of the same sense as we found in, in verse 7. This double-minded concept is, is not being able to stay the course, it's thinking, oh, will this happen? Will that happen? I'm not sure if God's going to keep his promise. I'm not sure if God can do what he says he's going to do. Maybe he will, maybe he won't. He did this time, but I'm not sure if he'll do it again. He did that time, but I'm not sure if he'll do it again. And when we become double-minded... Our ways, our very ways from day to day, our very daily actions become unstable. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. And this is truly, we see this in individuals' behavior. We see this in individuals' actions, that when a person is vacillating, when they're double-minded, they're unstable in virtually everything that they do. And so we need to look at ourselves and say, is our faith sound? Is our faith trusting? Is our faith secure? When we pray to the Lord 
and we have a petition to ask of him that deals with wisdom. And we can expand that to any petition that we have that is within his will. And we'll talk about that in more detail later. But if we have any petition to have wisdom to come through or to deal with a circumstance, are we trusting him fully, wholly, completely, without reservation? And that's that's a mirror we need to look in our own heart and see is that if that is indeed true. And if not, we need to look at all the times previously that we've trusted him. And we need to look at all the promises that he's given, including this one, concerning answering prayer. Now, as we move on to verse 9, we come to the third mirror in this first chapter of James. Verse 9 reads, Let the brother of low degree rejoice in that he has exalted. And that would be a brother of low degree being a lowly brother, one who is not highly esteemed, someone who doesn't hold a high position in the community. But the rich, in that he is made low, because as the flower of the grass, he shall pass away. All right, so this really is a contrast, all right? What we're looking at here is that there is one of low degree. He may not be wealthy. In fact, he might be quite poor. Also, not necessarily financially poor, but he's just someone who is not um, not of high stature in the community, whereas the other person is, is rich. He's well known. Uh, he probably does have a significant amount of stature in the community, and it's very common today, and it was very common practice at the time that this letter was written, that someone who was relatively wealthy, when they would come to a public gathering, they would be seated in a place of honor or in a place of significance near the host, perhaps even at the front of the gathering, whereas a commoner, as one might be called, would sit pretty much anywhere or maybe even in a place that uh, is not of significant favor. They may just sit somewhere, wherever seating is available, or maybe in one of those standing room only locations. Uh, one of the things that comes to mind when we look at uh, these two verses, 9 and 10, is one of the things that Jesus said uh, as he was uh, speaking about um, uh, as, as he was speaking about the hierarchy in heaven and the hierarchy here on earth. He said in Matthew chapter 19 beginning in verse 28, "Verily I say unto you that ye which have followed me, in the regeneration, when the Son of Man, and that is after the resurrection, when you are in heaven with me for all eternity, shall sit in the throne of his glory, that is the glory of my Father, ye shall also sit upon twelve thrones, judging, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. Now these twelve thrones are spoken of in Revelation chapter 4. Uh, we see well, we, we actually see um, 24 thrones altogether. Uh, these 12 thrones represent the 12 tribes of Israel from the Old Testament and the 12 apostles of the New Testament, 24 in all, showing the unification of the, of the Hebrew or the Israeli calling in the Old Testament, the, the, the nation of Israel being called out in the Old Testament, and the Christians being called out in the New Testament by the gospel, all called to the same Lord, and all called in the same way by grace through faith. No one was saved by the deeds of the law. We still we still respond to the call in obedience. It's just that they were looking forward to the Messiah to come. Now we can look up to the risen Messiah who has fulfilled the promise in the Old 
Testament. The book of Hebrews is replete with uh, with all of these uh, analogies that show how Jesus fulfilled uh, these messianic promises uh, according to the sacrifices. The book of Matthew, the gospel according to Matthew, shows how Jesus in his person fulfilled the messianic promises of the Old Testament. Verse 29 in Matthew 19 reads, And everyone that hath forsaken houses, or brethren, or sisters, or father, or mother, or wife, or children, or lands, and that would be your field, your property, for my name's sake shall receive an hundredfold and shall inherit life everlasting. And that doesn't mean you're getting a hundred times what you lost. That means you'll be receiving in abundance beyond measure. This concept of forsaking too, sometimes it means it in the literal sense because your closest relatives may refuse to accept the Lord Jesus Christ. They may refuse to honor God. They may refuse to accept the Lord. Or this forsaking has another meaning. It's saying you love me more than you love them because it's through me that you were given to them or they were given to you. You're setting priorities here. And this is what he's saying. Now, what he's doing is he's showing you what the heavenly priorities are all about. In other words, there are no lower and higher degrees below God. The Lord comes first. First commandment, thou shalt have no other gods before me. The commandments were not abolished in Jesus Christ. They were fulfilled in Jesus Christ. And this is something that James is addressing now. You see, many Christians get this wrong today. We are not commandment keepers today in the sense that we run around trying to do a checklist every day, trying to check off the Ten Commandments and then looking at all the all the edicts and all the laws and and, and so forth, and, and trying to keep all of those things according to kosher law and according to Old Testament law and so forth. We're not trying to do that today. That has all been fulfilled. But to walk in light of the Ten Commandments, to do the things that they say out of Exodus chapter 2, verses 3 through 20, to do those things, or Exodus chapter 20, verses 3 through 20, to do those things, amen, we should be doing those things because they are all the Christian walk. The Apostle Peter, the Apostle Paul, James right here, uh, and the Lord Jesus himself tells us these are the ways that we should be conducting ourselves because the first half of those laws or the first half of those commandments uh, tell us how we should honor God. The second half of those commandments tell us how we should honor our fellow man, and specifically our fellow believer, but fellow man in general. So we should still be walking in them. It's just they don't save us, but they certainly do reflect the Christ that's in us. There's the perspective, and this pleases God. We can't get saved by them, but it certainly does please God to live his word. Now, verse 30 is verse 30 ties it together. The Lord Jesus ties it up in a nice, neat bow right here, Matthew 19, 30. But many that are first shall be last, and last, and the last shall be first. And he's basically just saying right here, look, hierarchy in heaven and hierarchy with me is not like you see it on earth. In fact, it's basically backwards. The servant is most pleasing to his master. Whereas one who tries to lord it over everyone else, well, he's the lowest of the low in my eyes. The one who serves the most is the one who's the greatest in kingdom of he- in the kingdom of heaven. And Jesus does not say this just once. He says it many times. And I had a pastor who once said, you know, if God says it once, that's enough for me. If God says it once, it's important. If he says it's twice, it's very important. If he says it three or more times, you better listen. And Jesus says this many times. He talks about the humble, all right, the humble shall be exalted, and those that exalt themselves shall be abased. 
Right? He says this in many different ways throughout the Gospels. And we see this in the Proverbs, and we see this uh, through the writings of the, uh, of the apostles in the New Testament as well. We are not to lift ourselves up. And James will speak about this extensively here in, uh, in, in his letter as well. Again, verse 10, but the rich, in that he is made low, and, and that is that the rich uh, can easily be humiliated. What happens if he loses his riches? What happens if something ha- what, what happens if his riches are a result of his position and he loses his position? Or he loses his job or ability to work and maintain that richness, maintain that, uh, that, that high stature. Well, he can be made low very quickly. And we've seen it happen in our society today where a very wealthy, very prominent person all of a sudden falls completely out of favor, loses everything. In fact, goes into poverty. Right. So don't rely on your earthly riches. That's why Jesus tells us to lay up our treasures in heaven. So this third mirror is focusing on what? It's focusing on where are our treasures? What do we value? Do we value our status and our stature? Or do we treat each other equally as brethren in Christ? Do we treat each other each other equally as children of God, even if we're not saved, we are at least his creation created in his own image, and we should love one another, at least in that respect. But the rich in that he is made low, because as the flower of the grass, he shall pass away. One day we're all going to go back to dust, no matter how wealthy we are. The President of the United States, the Prime Minister of England, and the wino on the street corner are all going to die the same death. No matter how elegant and fancy their funeral may be, no matter how many Secret Service agents they may have around them, no matter how many times they get kicked to the curb, they're all going to die the same death, and they're all going to go to the same place, and that is in the ground. They're all going to turn to dust What's important is where are they going to be afterwards because eternity is far more important than what's happening here. Verse 11, For the sun is no sooner risen with a burning heat, but it withereth the grass, and the flower thereof falleth, and the grace of the fashion of it, and that is the glorious beauty of it, perisheth, so shall the rich man fade away in his ways. One day, is, this, is, this is also a reflection of human beauty. There are men who are incredibly handsome. They're born that way. They're born with, uh, with an old English word used as comeliness, you know, attractiveness. There are women who are, who are born with a, a natural beauty, a physical beauty that men are naturally attracted to. But that fades away. You don't keep that 30, 40, 50 years. It, it goes away. Sooner or later, one of my favorite expressions is gravity takes over. You know, the wrinkles start to show. A little bit of paunch happens in the midsection. You know, the the aging lines start happening in your face. And I don't care how many Botox injections you get. I don't care how much, uh, how much plastic surgery you get. Sooner or later, your face starts to look like a monkey. You start to look like a balloon. And you can't even speak right because of all the injections and the surgeries. Uh Man can't fix what God has designed. And right now we live in a fallen world and everything fails over time. We have a picture of it short term through the cycle of the seasons and through those things which live a much shorter lifespan than we do. But we are all destined one day to end our lives on this earth. We need not focus on that, folks. That's going to happen. In fact, I'm going to be doing a series of messages. I started one here um, not too long ago dealing with the issue of death and the fact that it's something none of us are going to escape. We're, We're all going to face it one day. What's important is looking to eternity. That's the most important thing. And if we treat everyone If we treat everyone here on earth today as if we are going to be with them for all eternity, or at least if we desire to be with them for all eternity, 
then things will be a whole lot better for each and every one of us. So as we consider that and look forward to our next message, let's stay in his word and stay true to his word. In Christ's undying love, amen.